Hello everyone and thank you for joining us for another Play UK Speaker Salon. Tonight we are hosting State of Play's founders Catherine Bidwell and Luke Whitaker. In their own words, they make stories that happen to be games and since setting up the studio in 2008, they have made six such stories. The latest one, South of the Circle, is being praised for its style and narrative, and tonight Catherine and Luke will talk all about what went into creating it. Since this will be a rather immersive session, all of your questions will be answered after the presentation. But before we continue, I would like to remind you that as a part of Play UK 2021, British Council has launched a three month mentorship program for 10 emerging video game uh, creatives from selected uh, countries across Europe. Those selected teams will have one on one sessions with UK based mentors from companies including Mediatonic, Astro Games, Unity and State of Play to name a few. The applications for the Play UK mentorship program are open until tomorrow at 5 p.m. CET. So make sure to to apply for this A great chance to to meet and um, work with these uh, awesome professionals. Now let's dive in into this session. Catherine and Luke, thank you so much for being here. Uh, could you please tell us more about yourselves, uh, about State of Play and South of the Circle? Hi, Luke and Catherine, could you please just unmute yourselves? It's a thing that happens here on Teams often. Hello, everybody. Hello. <laughs> Hi. Yeah, so I'm Luke uh, and I'm co-founder and creative director at State of Play. And I'm Catherine. I'm director of development at State of Play. So yeah, we started State of Play back in 2008. Um, and we have developed a number of games and often they're handmade games um, or at least they have some kind of handmade element to them uh, and yeah we're big fans of stories and our stories in our games are, have been getting deeper and deeper uh, with each game um, which is why we're very keen on showing you our latest one that launched recently which is South of the Circle. Uh, is there anything you'd like to add? No, so should no. we go straight in? We could go straight and, in and share our uh, screen. Share our screen. Um, we might, we'll mention a few games that you might know us for, which is um, Lumino City, uh, Kami 2 and Kami, the original, and Inks as well. Uh, and all of these were created with some kind of handmade element, Lumino City especially, which was where we built a three meter high model city and then filmed that. Uh, using a motion control camera and it was full of moving parts and miniature lights and motors um, and yeah it created a look unlike any other uh, so we really like to get hands on with every game that we make uh, including this one which is South of the Circle. So I can give you a little rundown of what South of the Circle is. It's a narrative adventure game um, and it's set in Antarctica in the 1960s, so the height of the Cold War. Uh, you play Peter, who's a Cambridge academic uh, who's crash landed out there. Uh, and at first it looks like it could be a, a th just a thriller, a let's fix the plane and get off the ice. Uh, but as you move out into the ice and the blizzard wraps itself around you, you actually start walking into memories and the whole game becomes an exploration of character and uh, and Peter and puts you in that place and asks uh, what would you do and also what have you done in the past so so we're going to chat a little bit about um what inspired us and the development process throughout the game so he's going to talk about when he first had um the idea for the game yeah uh, this is not our work this is uh the first thing that inspired the game um it's a book by michael chabon uh, called cavalier and clay um i really recommend it but there's an amazing uh there's an amazing chapter in it where the lead character um goes out to antarctica now it's a story of cousins who are fleeing europe during world war ii so they're jewish cousins and they're fleeing um, away from the persecution. One of them goes to Antarctica and comes across a German scientist out there 
and he's armed at the time. And it, the, the book poses a really interesting question about what would you do in that situation? And it got me thinking about, OK, who are we when we're removed from our context and our, the structures around us? Uh, so that was this, the nub of it. Uh, and what I did first was write a really short little interactive story. Just it was more playing with uh, with tools more than anything. But this is Inkle Writer uh, by the people who make 80 Days. Uh, if you're into an interactive narrative, I recommend playing around with it because they give it away for free. And yeah, this just allowed me to do something very small and a little experiment. Cool. Um, Look, before we uh, dive into into that uh, with, with more detail, uh, I'll just have to um, ping you again about sharing your screen. Unfortunately, we are yeah, we are unable to to see that. No, we're not able to see it. Yeah, we aren't able to see it. So could you please just check it check it again, please? Of course, we can. Of course, we can. Yes. Here we go. Sure. Thank you so much. No problem. Can you see this? Awesome. Now we can see it. Right. Now, now the immersive session starts, actually. That okay. makes so sense. Much. <laughs> um, OK, well, we've explained about That's this. The book. It didn't miss too much. <laughs> no, there's only been two slides. Yeah, yeah. Um, so anyway, I'll take it from here. So Luke, um, Luke might mention we were thinking about with his interactive um, kind of um, writing in the Inkle app. We were looking at like 1930s era, um, and one of my childhood friends is um, his. Her father is the head of British Antarctic Survey called John Doudney. And when we were talking about this idea with her about Antarctica, and, he, and she mentioned that actually the 1960s, when um, John first went out there, was such an interesting time. Um, there was so much exploration to do. There was like, you know, so much, it, there was so much the people didn't know about Antarctica and the kind of technology they were taking down there was so primitive. It, you know, you kind of think of the 1960s as, as quite um, advanced, but it really wasn't. Um, so she said, yeah, you know, why don't you have an interview with my dad and he might, you know, just help you as a guide in way. So this was probably four years ago. Um, we we did this and he we had this amazing interview with him a whole afternoon and as you can see he showed us some of these are his pictures from the 1960s Antarctica and just the kind of um, landscapes that this um, this showed you know really inspired us the way the light in Antarctica is just amazing you know they already had this graphic element that we really liked and the stories that he told us were just amazing they were kind of having to Morse code medical supplies and um, information to you know the mainland they were they actually told us the story about crashing in the Antarctica when he was trying to get help and someone was very ill and they were trying to fly someone out so this whole idea of this kind of plane crash at the start was really inspiring so I just flick through some of and yeah this is the kind of planes that were out there and this is the plane crash he he mentioned and it was documented and just this image just really sparked for us. Um, again, um, just some amazing kind of information you can get from these images. So, yeah, one fascinating thing was that he was uh, he became a big part of uh, something called the Antarctic Treaty and this was one of the revelations that came out and it's, it's something that I didn't know, I don't think many people know, but at the height of the Cold War, um, all, Antarctica was contested space. It was the only place in the world where, you know, both Russia, the USA, Britain and a lot of other countries around the world contested the same land. Um, and that the Cold War that they knew that that was going to cause a big problem and so what they did they got together it was in secret um, and to this day hardly anyone knows about this but they signed something called the Antarctic Treaty which prevented any use of weapons and said you can't make any extra claims on the land and it is held to this day so that became something that was really important to, uh, it was it was a story that needed telling uh, and we wanted to tell that story in amongst other things. 
So the next thing was that, yeah, we wanted to explore these ideas. And what I did was write a book which allowed me to take all, all of them and not only that, but give give them personality. So work out what the plot uh, could be. Although this looks like a, you know, a real book, it's you know, for me, it was more a working document, um, but it did allow me to get into the kind of depth of character that uh, we were really keen on uh, exploring with the game. Um, however, it then yeah. and I'd just like to add this was through year this took, this was years of development. You know, with in the meantime we were working on slightly smaller games. So you know this kind of you know had a working title of Ice kind of game that we knew we wanted to make was um, was was mum mumbling along while we were doing other development. And so the whole ethos with state of play from from the start, you know, from Luminary City is that we always want to be really authentic in what we're creating. We don't we didn't just want to make a kind of an idea of what we thought Antarctica looked like. Um, so we really, you know, want to get to the purest sense of this story. So we thought the, the way to do this was to actually do a research trip to Antarctica, um, which we did 2018, wasn't it? Yeah. That's right. Yes. Um, and that really um, opened our eyes to what it was like out there. Um, and we took old equipment, we took old cameras out there to to get visual material that would, would help us develop the style. Um, we also, yeah, just took a, a lot of photographs, to, did a lot of drawings. We discovered landscapes that we didn't know were out there. And this would have been, this was the danger. If we'd have stayed in the UK and just done it by Google Images, I would, would never have known that there were, you know, volcanic, uh, sunken volcanoes out there that you could walk around and that were just black ash. I think like if you see this image, our idea of Antarctica is very often the bottom right image, um, but it's so much more varied than that. And a lot of these places ended up um, in the game. And it enabled us to get real kind of hands on with the environment as well and, and do lots of drawings. Uh, we were, we went on board a ship, which uh, again was enabled to, enabled us to see lots of different parts of Antarctica. An on board ship, we were actually on board with uh, John Doodney, that an Antarctic advisor, and his daughter came along as well, our artist friend. And she brought with her a whole bunch of art materials so we could do printing on board the ship. Uh, and that's me doing some printing. Uh, it's the simplest kind of printing you can do. It's called monoprinting, where you just rub away. Uh, so it's quite intuitive and enables you to create, uh, in, uh, I guess, impressionistic uh, views of the place, which is what we were after. Uh, this is this is some of the work. Uh, it's just a kind of exploration of clouds, and the, there are these incredible little huts that you find along the way. Uh, and later on, you'll see how this uh, actually influenced images and in the game. We also took sound recordings. Again, we wanted to start our music um, soundtrack development, you know, with the, the real cure, um, pure essence of what Antarctica really sounded like. We had a motion capture suit um, that, you know, we walked through the snow and kind of took data from that. Um, so, yeah, we were all about kind of, you know, we really made the most of this trip and it was um, it really kind of honed what South of the Circle has become today. So again, were these back? This home? was yeah. These images are after coming back home. This is working out how to translate what we saw and all our stories in into a game. These are yeah, early sketches. We can carry on. Yeah, and you can see this this kind of style really emerging, and all from this first hand. Kind of John Dudney's photos and his stories and the trip to Antarctica um, continued, didn't it? Yeah. So, yeah, the next stage for us after having got all this visual material and then started sketching, um, written and an outline of the story was actually making that story uh, stronger make, and making it uh, an interactive story as well. So uh, I started work on the script. Um, but one thing that was apparent to me is that was that the book, I didn't have enough 
uh, opportunity in there to delve into the themes. And so the themes developed as I was writing the script. Um, and it, it, they naturally flowed from the, the, quest, the original questions that we asked, which was, what would you do if you were stuck out there? Um, and straight away you think, well, how did this person get out there? And, um, and what could he have done to lead him to this point? Uh, and this allowed us to ex explore like his memory and there are th like themes of regret and uh, maxi masculinity, especially toxic masculinity. Um, and this is set in the 60s where things were probably far more, uh, I don't know, there's, there, he, he finds himself in, in a situation where he's surrounded by a patriarchal system, which is putting pressure on him uh, to perhaps behave, behave in a certain way. Uh, and we ask questions of how does that affect someone who isn't necessarily uh, built for the kind of world around him, uh, that is around him or like does he take advantage of it uh, and what could that lead him to do could it lead him to do something he regrets so that's what writing the script allowed us to do and if we move on we could we'll see here how we how we're inspired by video games that we love so we love oxen free we love firewatch uh, and in narrative video games in general there is this um there's this kind of movement towards a more naturalistic way of uh, in of interacting with the world rather than like first of all it would have been text adventures where you were typing go left go right then you get to talk to people slowly but uh, we wanted to evolve the language um, and we're massively inspired by films and theatre uh, films that like before sunrise which is very naturalistic um, another of our favourite films is Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. Again, that deals with memory and regret. Um, and again, our inspirations were very much kind of filmic rather than, you know, the kind of clunky narratives that can sometimes be displayed in um, video games. So, you know, we wanted these scenes between our two main characters to feel to flow really naturally like how we do as humans in a conversation you know we may not always have the right answer and we kind of wanted to feel like we just get in a snapshot of this kind of intimate moment between two characters mm. and in games uh, it's often presented as text this is the thing we've accepted so you will read a line of text which will be or you'll get three of them and you'll have to read it process what it means, what it might come out as, and you select and then you deal with the consequences. But that's not how we behave in real life. Um, in real life, we kind of lead with a spark of something and it's far more free flowing. We start a sentence without knowing how we're going to finish it. So we wanted to, to develop our own new way of talking within a game uh, and we developed a prototype. And as you notice, our two favourite films, the characters both meet on a train don't they mm -hmm. and then <laughs> naturally Clara and Peter in South of the Circle meet in a train so this was one of the early prototypes wasn't it that's right um and yeah we wrote a short script for this and it was it enabled us to technically see what would happen when we could get characters talking over each other um and one thing that came from it was that we knew acting was going to be so key to it. I mean, some actors that we auditioned for roles would come and say, so do you want me to give my video game voice for this? And we were like, no, 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 no. Right, this, the, the point is that it, this is about being as natural as possible and we want you during rehearsals to improvise a little bit and see what comes out of it. Um, and so, yeah, we, we made sure that we went for the very, uh, best actors um, that we could and we rehearsed very uh, very in a very in-depth way I'd say so the actors that we found eventually um, we we worked with Gwilym Lee who plays our lead he was uh, um, he was in Bohemian Rhapsody we've got Olivia Vinyl who's uh, recently been on in Roadkill on uh, on the BBC we've got uh, Anton Lesser who's in Game of Thrones um, we've got Adrian Rawlins, uh, who's in Chernobyl, uh, and we've got Richard Goulding there, who's in The Crown. Uh, and so 
yeah, we spent a lot of time with these actors um, workshopping things and working together to like, th these are the kind of actors who really did care about what the backgrounds of their characters were. And often it would influence the script. We'd um, be talking to them and say, they'd say, okay, what was our relationship like 10 years before? And it would make me think, right, okay, that's a question I hadn't actually answered and, we, and we'd get into more mm -hmm. details. So yeah, that it, it was absolutely key to creating this narrative flow and so that when we got on set it was a really natural uh, uh, place for them to be they were yeah. they were in the character uh, and I think you'll see that reflected in the performances when you play it and it is um, our mocap session we were obviously like this is a mobile game this is on Apple Arcade um, and it's a mobile game that uses full motion capture. We wanted to capture all the nuance of our characters. We wanted the, every little uh, little motion that might give away what they're thinking. We did full facial capture as well like this. Um, and all that really does mean something when you're when you're creating a story. Even if the character isn't saying anything, what they're doing with their eyes is important. And uh, yeah, we wanted to really push what was possible. It was a lot of work. Yeah. <laughs> This is what so an interactive making, script looks like. Making everything interactive just meant, you know, this this was a normal day with the actors and and kind of, yeah, <clears throat> we asked a lot of them and they they were they were fantastic and we're really delighted with the results. So we're going to chat about um, the mechanics, how we um, how the characters um, converse with each other and and what we decided on that now. Yeah, so it's all very well, like we, we could get our actors and um, talking very naturally and we yeah, get very nuanced performances and emotional performances there. But how do you uh, get that emotional sense into what into the actual interaction? <laughs> so rather than reading text, um, what do you do? And so what we have done is created a system which is it's like emotional symbols. So what happens is is that these buttons uh, which are almost like thought bubbles pop up above your character and you can see if I go back to the first one that one is a um, is a certain, it jitters around we haven't got a, a movie of it here but <clears throat> that jitters around as if in panic and so you instinctively feel that the character's panicked uh, and you can select it uh, there is another emotion displayed here which is th this is an uh, an open and uh, caring kind of emotion that those blue circles calmly move out. So these are these are emotions that the character may be feeling. One may appear before the other, um, and so you're getting an interiority. You're seeing what's in, what's inside the character's mind and what he's what he's feeling in himself, uh, and you get to lean on on these things depending on how you feel the scene is going and the character. That you're talking to will respond to, to what you're saying appropriately. So we've seen a little bit of the style in those images but I think Kath will be able to take us through a little bit about the style and how we developed yeah. it. So as it says um, it's a handmade style which is very um, kind of part of the state of play ethos. Um, we again we almost you know like creating kind of textures and a patently feel on our on our games um, through all the ones we've previously made. Um, and again, this is just some of the inspiration we had, you know, the the old um, travel um, posters are, are quite familiar. We love this kind of screen printing quality they added to to the game and, and how they how they look. So this was a big inspiration. Um, and again, you know, these kind of flat colours, but they really bring a scene to life and and we love this kind of um, feel um, and coinciding with that influence we're surrounded at, at home here by Luke's grandfather Ray's screen prints he was an artist in the time the game is set in the 1950s and 60s and um, he uh, you know these these just without knowing we were unconsciously like influenced by them um, and just the way the kind of 
shapes of the buildings, the images, you know, and this again, this flat colour, it, it really sets it in a time and place. Yeah, absolutely. Like, um, and the feel of the image was really important to us getting getting an almost tactile quality to this. Um, and that's that's why we looked at paintings as well. So the, these are by Hopper, um, who does wonderful things with lighting. Uh, and so as and it's also about a reduced color palette, really. It's about saying, OK, well, what can we can we do it with four colors? Only choosing four colors and can we do it better than if you were given a million colors? And I think that's true. Yeah. <laughs> and I think it's in, in video games now so much as possible. Mm. They often very much look like of this moment. They're put they're led by what technology is possible right now. A game of 10 years ago looks like a game of 10 years ago. We wanted to create something that was in a way timeless, um, but also felt very realistic and rooted when it was. And the way um, and the way, you know, someone like Hopper um, kind of focuses um, the whole image on that character, you know, the background is important, but, you know, we, our eyes are completely drawn to this woman at the table and knowing how important the emotional journey that our characters were going to go on, you know, to, to, to use to use the scene in a way like this, where we could put all our focus on this character was really important to us. Yeah, absolutely. And so we worked on more concept art. This is one of the first bits of concept art where, you know, very few colours, but it, it works with this epic scale. You only need three or four colours and you actually feel, uh, you know, the massive yeah. scale of the place and a character in relationship to it. So we knew that it was going to work with the epicness of Antarctica. And then we did some experiments on interiors as well. So does it work with interiors? This is in uh, some concept art for the inside of a British base. And yeah, it was working really well for us here as well. And we start to think of these more like almost like theatre sets where, yeah, you can like you can spotlight something and you draw the draw the eye to just what's important um, in the scene. So we knew it was going to work really well for our environment but a massive challenge is characters i mean you can see this image is i get away with it because i've turned the character's face away from camera but it's like okay if you're going to do this with just a few colors how do you develop a, a realistic face um, and get the most out of our actors so again we turn to painting uh, and the, this is a painting by Caroline Walker, uh, and if we zoom in on one character, this was this was an image that really inspired me to think that well, you know, characters can be just a couple of brush strokes, and you see more than than is there, um, and so that's what uh, I wanted to achieve. Yeah, with the and work. as a as a player, you you fill in the blanks. You know, it's mm. it's 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 a really important inspiration for us to look at paintings and how how they work rather like we've said before you know rather than just putting more and more on the screen we were kind of like okay let's strip things back to get the essence of what we're trying to say as story makers and you can see that uh, this is a final image um from some of our art that yeah just by taking it down to two colours and a, and a few lines in the right places, you get uh, a lot of information and a lot of emotion we feel into these, especially when they're moving. So yeah, we, we this is how we set on this look for the entire game and knew that it would work. And, and this was our process. We would work with Cheryl Lynn, who's a great character artist, uh, and she'd do a rough first, like the image you see on the left, uh, and then we'd work into it in 3D and produce an image like that on the right. And if we move on, um, the characters were something that we wanted to put a lot of effort into because this is a very character led drama. Uh, it was really important that these characters felt real, that they were really researched, that what they were wearing was like the right of the time. Yeah. Um, yeah. And yeah, it, down to the exact hairstyle of the character, uh, all the different costumes they might have. And we give our characters different costumes for different environments that they're in. Um, yeah. 
which shouldn't be novel for a video game, but somehow is. Um, and yeah, then we went back to researching the environment as well. Like the, these are actual images from a hut inside. Uh, yeah, it's an old abandoned hut, uh, a British one from in the 1950s in Antarctica. Yeah, and as we've probably said before, but you know, it was important for us just to get every the details, the finer points, just right. You know, we wanted to um, to make this feel a completely authentic experience when the players playing it at home. Yeah, and so the, we wanted to create a realistic environment as well. You can see, like in the previous image, we have a, an old map of Antarctica. Well, we wanted to design our level as if it was a real place, and it could physically exist in the in the place uh, in the way that. In the space basically if you could walk from one end to another uh, it would be possible so you can see it started with really <laughs> rough uh drawings which had to be crossed out a lot because our script would change um, and we'd work up something like the one on the right which split into zones different acts uh, so it's like a three-act drama this and that enabled us to have something on the wall that we could refer to and go okay this is where we are this is where we need to be uh, and allowed everybody from the people who were help, helping out with writing to the people who were designing the actual landscape. And it also helped us actually design props for the game. So this is a little map that you can actually look at in the British base and, and hopefully feels authentic because it's based on a real thing. So finally, we just wanted to go in a bit more detail about uh, the concept art and how and the research and how we got to our final game uh, from there. We worked with uh, Catherine Unger who came on board uh, to help with concept art and she would do big deep dives into finding research material for, for the places. This is in, inside of a hut. Uh, I think this is Scott's hut that's still out there. Mm. And you can see that this is then concept art that we would work up into the final game. And again, it has this real kind of like theatre feel that Luke mentioned, you know, you can really like place a character in there and using clever tricks like light and 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 textures, um, it brings the scene together. So again, we had all this raw material from um, from John Doodney, our scientific advisor. Um, and again, you know, you can't like he always says, you can't take a bad photo in the Antarctica. <laughs> so yeah, like you know, these these could easily like be up on the wall and and look beautiful. So we felt really privileged to you know he just gave us hundreds and hundreds of files. Um, so we felt like you know we could really set this scene um where peter is you know it could really be placed in the right right place and actually feedback from um from from john since he's played the game is that you know he really felt like he was walking about um back when he first um went to antarctica so that was a real a real privilege for us for him to say that we're really pleased yeah. he said that yeah and again you know having these raw materials meant our, you know, when we were concept art artists could could really get a feel for a place. Yeah, and we were able to, you know, do, get quite technical and make sure that everything made logical sense and was built correctly with these kind of uh, images. Uh, and Kath Unger would <coughs> work with like with lighting as well and, and do colour tests like this. Yeah. And so this was our goal. We uh, we're quite keen on always making uh, concept art that is close to our final art. Um, it frustrates me a lot when I see games with beautiful concept art and then the game looks very much like a game. Um, I just kind of want to play in the concept art. So yeah. um, this is uh, a still from the game. And yeah, we feel like, especially like, I feel like in motion um, with the, when the snow's whipping around you and everything, I feel like we really captured the atmosphere of that place. Um, and Kath Unger's uh, like hand, sketch, hand sketched work was really important as well, very atmospheric. 
uh, and we'd work it up into something a little more mm -hmm. detailed and then uh, this is it in the in the final game um going back to that original image uh, of the hut in antarctica you can see how that directly informed uh, a scene in the game uh, and yeah that that's the thread that we tried to keep going always kind of referring back to our handmade materials and and getting close to it yeah. so yeah the grain you can see you'll be able to see in, in clouds of steam in the actual game and thing, things like that uh, yeah and this is some more concept art which is just kind of showing the kind of level of detail we had to go on designing the rocks and the environment getting it feeling right um all these things are based on real places uh, and uh, that's the game itself where you can actually explore that environment and yeah it was released about a month ago yeah on apple arcade it's been it was been four years in development but for all this effort that we've put into it to, to try and make it a really a, an emotional story and a, one that felt authentic it seems to be getting a good reception so far and uh, like some of the reviews uh, have been lovely <laughs> and uh, and people seem to have despite the fact it's not it's not exactly equatable to any other game and uh, people seem to be seeing uh, the depth in there yeah we're really pleased, we're about. Really pleased about and the the importance we put on the narrative and the characters and the acting you know they're the things that people are really um taken to their heart and so we're, we're really proud of this and and four years in development when you know it's it's just a just a relatively small team you know and us kind of going this is good this is <laughs> this is right isn't it it feels right we should do yeah. it you know to actually then have it out in the open world and for people to love it as much as we do um it's one of the best things about designing and making games so we're really proud yeah and we hope that um lots of people will be able to play it discover it and yeah uh enjoy it for themselves awesome awesome thank you so much um but what is it that you want all those uh, all those players to take away with them after playing the game? Well, that's a good question. Lots of things. Yeah. I think um, what I would like, as <laughs> speaking as a writer, <laughs> as a, like from a narrative point of view, I I would like people to go away and think about themselves in some way and, and that this gets you closer to someone's thought process we think than ever before mm -hmm. and in that way kind of encourages you to think of your own like you are Peter and you are you know you're seeing it at the same time but you're also inhabiting him and you might be spotting similarities to how your thought patterns work you might look back on memories of your own and 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 see how they they might be similar yeah. so yeah I would uh, it would be great if people would take uh, take that away from it. It, it, it yeah. means something to them, and it will yeah. mean something different to everybody. Yeah, there's lots of issues, and and there's the thing with self circle. You you kind of think it's a certain game, and then I think we've noticed as people start playing it, they have a really deep emotional connection to to bits of it, and it talks about regrets and memories and what you could have done, what you should have done, and and basically we just want people to have a kind of discussion with themselves about it and if it keeps asking questions of people then we're we're happy with that awesome and what are the the plans for south of the circle like is it going to be available on other platforms in the future and when yes yes it, hopefully it so will be watch this space <laughs> <laughs> we think towards the end of next year it um we hope to bring it to as many other platforms as possible mm -hmm. and do you maybe uh, are thinking about exploring um vr or ar games is that an interesting medium to to you it it was interesting actually when designing this game um because it was such an immersive environment to create uh, we got talking and we were like this would be amazing to experience 
in VR. So yeah, it was interesting. And I can still see something like this working where yeah. you, you kind of hang where the camera is and experience the, the environment. So it's it's not something that we're working on right now, but yes, in the future, I would say it's an Possibly. interesting prospect. Okay, so it, it's on the table. Uh, cool. Yeah, so the game is has been like getting praises for its uh, for its aesthetics and for yeah for the art style and uh, yeah big kudos to to the, to the artists working to to Catherine uh, is it Catherine yeah working on it um, um, but yeah the, the audience is curious and so are we uh, actually like um, is there a way to look into your uh, concept art uh, or into those research photos you you took on your trip? Uh, yeah, do you plan to put those online, like make a little art book or something? Yeah, we'd love to, you know, we'd love to get them out. I think we've just been so busy kind of getting to launch that, you know, it's it's something that will come out. But yeah, we just we just haven't quite had a chance to um, to get our heads around that at the moment. But yeah, we we'd um, you know, we'd love to showcase these um, these images and photos in any way we can. So yeah, it's definitely on our radar. Yeah. I mean, we love doing that kind of thing too. We yeah. made it we made a making of app for Luminum City, which is free on the app store for people who want to see. But yeah, that was really absolutely everything. Uh, about the making of Luno mm. City that we could get, and it's all interactive and, as well. And yeah, we we're so. excited just to, to to discuss it with with you. You know, there is you know there's so much more we we could say about this game. You know, we haven't even touched on the soundtrack and the scenes in Cambridge and kind of there's a whole you know we could we we could talk about this game for hours, couldn't we? And, yeah. 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 Cool. So, how big how how big is the studio at, uh, at the moment, and how many people were actually involved into making this making uh, South of the Circle? So we we kind of state of play. We kind of expand and contract. But making this game, we had five full time employees, but then we also worked with many fantastic freelancers and contract um, people to get this game. So you know. Um, I haven't got a head count to hand, but yeah, so, you know, we worked with... I mean, um, dozens of people have worked on it yeah, over the four years, the but four it was years. always just a core of about five. five or six, yeah. Awesome. And um, since the development lasted there for, for four years and so many people were involved with it, in it, like at which point did you did you sec secure the funding for this game and uh, how did you actually uh, fund the game? Like, and does the, the trip to Antarctica count as like pre-production? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, that was the good thing about that. That was like, I mean, we weren't sure if it was going to be worth it. You can never know until you're there and it's an expensive thing to do. But you saw like how important it, important it was. It was. Yeah. So we were really relieved because a lot of this has been self-funded along the way. And we've tried to keep as independent as possible because yeah. we're, because I mean, Luna City was fully self-funded um, and it allows us to pursue exactly what we're interested in um, without too many external pressures. So uh, this this one, we've had uh, some help from the Creative an, EU fund, yeah, media fund. And it's an exclusive on Apple Arcade. So that's part of the the, the deal we had had with them. So, yeah. Awesome. Now, uh, since you have worked with um, a lot of a lot of collaborators and also, yeah, so artists and architects and scientific advisors, um, who else would be a dream collaborator for you for a future game? Oh, good question. Well, any, you know, you know, we don't. I don't know because yeah, it, it, it depends, depends on, on the, the game. Uh, like he was the, the the you know John Dooney was the the dream collaborator, yeah. but we didn't know it beforehand. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it really depends on the game. Like Blumino City, we worked with a fantastic um, architect, but obviously for this game, we wouldn't need that kind of um, kind of person. But um, yeah, I don't know. Um, it. I mean, we all often. These people are often from outside the games industry, so yeah. that's one thing. The, and the lovely thing about what happens with our, it, 
is that people see, seem to see our games from outside the industry and get in touch and say, you know, I'm a musician and I'm working. Are you interested in collaborating? So, yeah, that kind of thing is uh, always fascinating to us. So if anyone yeah, is in a different industry out there <laughs> wants well, to get in touch. Yeah. yeah yes. Just any, interested. you know, interesting, creative people. Um, we're obviously drawn to. Mm, yeah, I'm not, I don't want to be down on games <laughs> at all. I would like this is it's just it's it's good to be influenced by many different things cool um could you tell us more about the tools and processes that you use to gather and explore and just navigate all the all the research and all the sources of inspiration and how this gu guides you into like transforming it into into a game all the tools i mean sketchbook is the first one it, we always we always start with physical tools yeah as state of play um so working into a sketchbook um it was a in terms of um turning this into a game it was a real um it a change for us where lumino city was created a lot the environment was created by hand and then there was a lot of video work and it was created in flash since then, our games have been made in Unity, so uh, that's yeah, that that's all we work with now. But this was a huge game to create mm. in Unity. Um, but yeah, we we were just uh, slowly sort of kind of ramping up what we knew was possible with so, Unity. Yeah, concept art, the motion capture, the animation, it it all just came together, didn't it? Um, with some fantastic developers, but yeah. Um, yeah, I think well, we work with other companies as well. So we work with Audio Motion, which helps provide the the motion capture. They had their own tech, um, but then they could provide us with the data that would work in Unity. So there was a lot of collaboration uh, that went along uh, along the way. Yeah, who helped you most with uh, these ideas of um, uh, exploring these ideas of toxic uh, max masculinity, loneliness, um, that um, yeah, that are like the, the which are like the, the foundation of uh, of the game. Yeah, well, it was an important story that I wanted to tell. I mean, there are certain times that I've encountered this kind of thing in the real world, um, and it, I felt it important to get um, script advisors on uh, who could provide different perspectives on this too. So. Um, we work with Catherine Neal, who's uh, who uh, she writes great interactive narrative, and Olivia Wood similarly. Um, and yeah, we work with some uh, some other wonderful script advisors uh, who helped bring different perspectives on it. And I work very closely with uh, our producer, our creative producer John Lau as well, on the script. Uh, and we could both bring our own experiences of uh, of this in the world. Uh, to it and yeah I think all that just really gave it a soul and a truthfulness mm. and I feel like it's a story that needs telling I think um and also like you'll notice that our, our lead character is a man a kind of and video like there's that the cliche of the male strong lead um and this was actually our kind of interesting way into talking about these issues so our character is not like it may appear like it's a hero's journey at the beginning. What if, you know, we are we ask what if this character is not necessarily your traditional um, mm. hero? Uh, and how do how would a real person? Get? Yeah, and it was like, yeah, you know, with Peter, he's, he's kind of at times like we all would be in this kind of situation, just making it up as as he kind of goes along and kind of, yeah, we really wanted to to shine a light on this kind of, like non-hero um in a game in a game sense and um and i think i think we we do and it's mm. just something it's not so necessarily something we we research deeply but it's just something we felt you know playing games and we felt you know in other situations mm. that um we could portray in in this form yeah and also toxic masculinity in particular is often seen through a lens of or like from a victim's point of view of it uh, and yeah our, 
I wanted to widen the debate about who the victims can be, because everyone is a victim of it, including the supposed male beneficiaries mm. of it in many ways. Um, and there will be many uh, men who may be like, feel like they have to act in a certain way. Um, and in, in the end, it is to their their own detriment. Uh, and so and I also think it's and it's about personal responsibility as well and taking personal responsibility. I think the, there's a, a thread there that's that's dealing with the idea that for things to change, it is not it can't just be a conversation about a, a, a victim of it saying this is wrong, you need to change it, and it becoming po <clears throat> polarized like a lot of debates mm -hmm. are. This is about like change has to come from within. And this is why I think hopefully the game is relevant to many movements of change that need to happen. You could have, because it is often the supposed oppressor who actually needs to realize and change their behavior um, rather than themselves uh, rather than being told mm -hmm. it. And so this game hopefully s illustrates that point. Awesome. And um, how did the uh um okay so but how did it like the the, the changes in the in the la landscape of video games uh, advancement in technology and in the world like how um how did the, those changes uh, affect um, affect your own practice and your approach in the in the games over over this time because like okay now we were talking about how these uh, changes about um um, uh, toxic mess about the changes in in uh, in our s society and the narratives, how uh, they like inspired you uh, to uh, uh, inspired your approach for for the game. But how did uh, the the overall uh, changes in in technology like ha have they in somehow uh, um, affected your your approach to to games as well i mean i think this kind of game has only recently been possible at least for a small team to make this kind of game uh would not have been possible yeah. uh at least in the same way no. 10 years ago um and uh, and it's allowed us to get to this quite this naturalistic way of yeah of talking and and that way of uh, yeah, interacting with the game. Yeah, we probably would have found ways um, ways around it. You know, we've we've both done like rotoscoping in the back in in the past. Um, you know, um, but but have been able to get this motion capture technology has been really good for the game. But again, I think I think with all our games at State of Play, we kind of we're always pushing what's possible. It's not necessarily we come up with an idea and then look at the technology, you know, we kind of, the idea definitely comes first and then we find a way to make it. So we weren't in the early days really concerned as much with how are we going to make it? We, we were more like, what do we want to make? So, so um, that yeah. was kind of how we were. Yeah. And I mean, I think we just kept pushing it. Yeah. <laughs> like at it's, first it could have, it could have been static characters talking with text. Yeah. Right? But the more we pushed it and the more mm. we were like, this needs to be fully mocap to get this across. Yeah. And then it was like, this needs facial animation to really get this across. And you could yeah. see our head of development, like, uh, sorry, te our tech uh, director, just, go, <laughs> are you sure? We're not going to do facial animation. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And we ended up doing it. And it's like, he created a, a whole system for interactive facial animation. And like, unbelievable. Yeah. I think what he managed to do, considering we said we still wonder <laughs> we how it got made, but yeah, you know, we j again we just want to like push what's capable, and and if we've got the vision, we kind of try and make it happen. make the tech fit. Yeah, fit. make the tech fix, fit. And not yeah. we don't use anything off the shelf. I think we often build everything quite bespoke ourselves yeah. to make that yeah. happen. Awesome and. Um, the range of games that you have created for uh, for the past like 12 years has been very, very eclectic. And the question is like, how do you keep, how do you keep yourself inspired? Good question. After, after yeah. this time, like how, how do you do it? Like how do you choose like which 
which interests uh, do, do, are you are you going to follow with with this one? So I think there's a bit of a mistake we all make, which is that we need to hunt for inspiration, and actually. Our solution has always been to wait and give it time. And like this has been four years in the making, but really, I think, I mean, I read that book mm, 10 years ago, I think, and then mm. started writing something about it. That first little um, interactive narrative ice story made in Inkle Writer was seven years ago. So maybe not that long, but still it was like, yeah, it, yeah. it's just been gestating for a while. Yeah. And it, I, and so, and that came from somewhere random, like reading yeah. a book. So uh, yeah, it is really just about waiting and we're not in any rush, for example, now to start yeah. the next thing right now. We've got, we've got a few sort of things murmuring around and we're often, you know, what, what I do find exciting is, you know, this South of Circles, we've, given it you know we've given it everything and we feel quite like whoa you know we'll take a break but actually as soon as we finish we're both kind of like there's the odd grain of ideas kind of bubbling away so i yeah to to actually be like right this is what we're making that's the kind of that's the kind of scary part where you're like okay we've got these ideas which one and and it just kind of naturally finds a way of rising to the surface and kind of we're like yeah it's very rarely just, when you go looking for yeah, it yeah yeah and it's just the, the idea that kind of interests us the most really mm -hmm. um and we feel that we can find a way to 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 tell the story we, we want to tell that's really it we don't yeah and i liken it to like digging for gold or something where you uh, there'll be something that you do that maybe hits or looks like a little seam of something and you follow it and you find there's more there yeah. and there's more there and there's more and then suddenly it opens out and so that's all you can really yeah. do and uh, it's really exciting when that happens you know there'll be months and months where we're kind of just talking about or you know even sketching a few things and then we'll just have that moment where we're like yeah actually that that could be really good so mm -hmm. let's go down there but um but yeah, I think the ideas are always there. We don't we don't really have to go looking for it. It's just knowing, you know, which one to kind of set settle on. Awesome, awesome. Um, could you tell us more about uh, putting story in a script format and then transforming it into a format needed for the for the game? Like, how do you do it? You mean in uh, in terms of the technology? Is that what you mean? Um, Maybe. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I, I think that I, mean, I, can, I can answer a bit yeah. of both. I yeah, suppose. Probably, well, yeah. uh, first of all, from from a writing point of view, writing interactive narrative is is very different to writing a, a linear one. In, in that, if someone can say three different things in a conversation, go three different directions, that you have to. You have to do <laughs> a billion times the work because it can also branch and um, but they all have to feel convincing as well so you have to work ultra hard um, and so initially you have to make a bit of a mental um, a mental switch so you're kind of inhabiting the character very closely like Peter if he has three different emotional responses to something you're asking that question every single time um and you don't have any tricks you can't write any long form and he stared out the window and felt like this it all has to be in in the dialogue so yeah i mean that's how writing a book helped first though so you can do you can get the depth into the book um and then understand your character that way and then turn it into a script rather than diving straight into the script uh, the script was written in yarn um which is a great bit of technology it's put together by the um i think it's used in night night in the woods and that again is open source and it's great it's if anyone's made anything with twine it's quite similar it's like having a ton of post-its on the wall and you can put bits of string between it uh, and it can deal with variables and things like that so yeah you like things uh, i recommend that as a good uh, good way to start and 
yeah, that can get as complicated as you like. It is like a never ending board. And so what starts is often a very simple story suddenly becomes this mess looking like one of those police procedural things with white, like what red string going everywhere. Uh, and you have to somehow keep a track of it. But it is a good way to do it. And yeah, then that and our tech director, George, uh, found a way of you know, passing that into the game. And I think, first of all, we started with before sunrise, we took the script, we took the audio from the, from the film. And he, I, we wrote it out in yarn and then you could basically have an interactive version. You couldn't say different things, but it allowed us to actually be in that scene mm -hmm. um, and to, and to it tested our technology as well. And then from then on, it was just about expanding, yeah. making it make the faces play in time, making the gestures play in time. It, so it became uh, this huge bit of technology yeah. created, but that was the start of it. And then also editing it when scenes when, you know, we felt that we could say it in a slightly different way, we then edited it. Yeah. And again, as we chatted about in the presentation, you know, working with the actors as well to kind mm -hmm. of hone what we wanted to say. I would recommend editing everything. <laughs> like, you know, we, I mean, we talked about editing our colours down to, no, to nothing <laughs> or just to what's essential with an interactive script, really get it down yeah. to absolute essential, even down to does your character really need to pick up a pen? Because although it's easy to make a character fly, that is going to be about three weeks worth of work for someone <laughs> to get their fingers right. And, and yeah, so we learned a lot <laughs> along the way and all this simple stuff, which is it's just a normal scene with two people like talking like talk about pens. <laughs> it's like we're the, we're the most complicated thing you can do in games. Awesome. Well, uh, Catherine and Luke, thank you so much. It was really uh, thank you firstly, like for all the the writing advice and advice on how to find inspiration. Uh, it was really uh, but besides this, it was really amazing like to see how much uh, uh, of passion and dedication went into making south of the circle and um, on behalf of all of us uh, thank you so much for um yeah for being our guests tonight oh, thank it's you a pleasure. it's been a, it's been a great thank you ever so much yeah thanks for listening <laughs> you're very welcome and i'll also like to remind uh, all uh, our audience that um the video the, the, the video of this lecture will be available in the next couple of days on the british council's uh, website um, also, don't forget that our last speaker salon in 2020 will be held on 16th of December and we will welcome Amanda Johnston back, former CG supervisor for Framestore Riders uh, Rides team. And in her role, Amanda has worked as a part of the design team for a range of uh, themed entertainment experiences and rides around the world. And um, in, in the next session, Amanda will uh, provide insight into the design and development of some of the recent projects that uh, she worked across. And she will also reflect on the parallels between video games and themed entertainment. So it's going to be a very exciting uh, session. So don't forget, uh, yeah, remember to, to join us on 16th of December. Uh, thank you all and we will see you soon. Bye. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye.